A lot of people out there. It's really nice to see all these people. A lot of times you go to a place, there's not any people there at all. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, I want to say thanks uh, to uh, Mike Monaco and Steve Kaminsky for having us put on the show today. <laughs> um, sorry, there's, we have like a really high tech presentation next. Capitalism has things growing out of it. Uh, in the case of global capitalism, while we may easily enumerate the structures that sustain it and are in turn sustained by it, the systems that facilitate interstructural integrity are perhaps more obscure. Uh, because the transoceanic vessel was uh, paradigmatic of the first instance of global capitalism, it follows that hegemony was first achieved by the Dutch, uh, who built many reliable transoceanic vessels at a historical moment in the 17th century when European mercantilism had reached um, an unprecedented scale, while the political climate was highly unstable in the wake of the Thirty Years' War. Dutch economies became the economies of emerging global capitalism uh, when Dutch traders embraced the concept of global capitalism as the basis for the transoceanic vessel. This embrace constituted the Dutch as the first global capitalist hegemony, a role they played until their prowess in this capacity was challenged by Great Britain and France in the 18th century. Great Britain's hegemony was cemented because like the Dutch before them, their embrace of and success in exploiting the transoceanic vessel facilitated their inheritance of the role of systemic regulator of global capitalism, the basis for the European state. France was able to, uh, oh, it was unable, unable to assume this role, even as most of Europe fell under its sphere of political influence in the area of Napoleon, precisely because its economy was confronted by the limits of the land whereas Britain's dominance of the sea simultaneously and the paradigm by which this access was facilitated the transoceanic vessel. Uh, whereas the Dutch had been cautious to couch any mention of their transoceanic vessels in purely mercantile terms, the British were the first or at least the most effective of the European powers to recognize the fecund ambiguity of the paradigm whose limits for absorbing the syntams of other theretofore discrete paradigms proved as elastic and inclined to fruitful syntagmatic miscegenation as the English language itself. This is to say that the transoceanic vessel could also be used politically. While the transoceanic vessel was the chief signifier of an incipient system whose paradigm was ostensibly mercantile in orientation, this was merely suggested by the fact that the transoceanic vessel's resemblance to vessels that had appeared in earlier systems to pursue a circumscribed range of mercantile activities according to the prevailing generic notions of what had happened to constitute mercantile activity at a given place and time persisted. Pardon me. The transoceanic vessel is paradigmatic of global capitalism precisely because it is not merely a vessel in the sense of how vessels were understood prior to the advent of the transoceanic vessel. The bellies of these great vessels are where the military and industry got to know each other better, flirted, fought, and shared a first kiss. The immense complexity of ship life hides a fragile ecology of alienation. The transoceanic vessel is a site of feverish intensity, a weird assemblage of contradictory structures systematized because they must be. This is the great secret of capitalism itself. It is, in fact, an integral system. It's a system that grows by consuming the contradictions that it pretends not to admit. The ideological basis of capitalism is a concept of infinity. This is the ocean over which it sails. Uh, but there are things living under the ocean. There be sea monsters.
Uh, as the early 20th century progressed, it became increasingly clear that the British Empire would no longer be able to perform the systemic role of the British Empire. The two heirs apparent were the United States and, at the time, the new nation of Germany. The short fiction of Catherine Mansfield is a system that recommends further theoretical investigation. It operates enigmatically on the level of the connotative, precisely in order to invite scrutiny. Of particular interest are her Hostelgeschichte, a group of loosely connected fictions concerning the observations and exploits of an English woman traveling through Germany on the eve of the First World War. Uh, like, like capitalism and like nearly all of the hostile Geschichte, uh, Germans at Meat, the title of one of her story, begins in medias res, in this case during the course of a meal in which bread soup is placed upon the table. Uh, Mansfield indicates an implicit trust in her reader's ability to make meaning from context in her <coughs> pronounced dispensation of the particulars of scene as it pertains to the physical environment. Instead, offering what might at first appear a sort of compensatory abundance of conversation in which food and the body are unchallenged in their primacy. Paradoxically, however, the food and bodies being discussed <laughs> are seldom the ones that are actually present. Uh, the narrator is a non entity. A pale and ghostly figure at the margins of her own fiction, repeatedly interrupted by the boisterous chatter of the Germans around her. The general tenor of the remarks are polite, but their frequency is unnerving. The effect is a kind of dinner obscene, in which strange voices loudly discuss past meals while gorging on a feast that's barely acknowledged. Snippets of conversation, non sequiturs, obscure references and reference. The fact that the discussion is insistently steered into the realm of consumption foregrounds the act of consumption as paramount to the object of Mansfield's humorous but slightly harrowing imminent critique of the process by which the capitalist ideology is sustained and recapitulated. Mansfield's critique is an imminent one by virtue of the fact that it demonstrates via recapitulation the ideological structure of capitalism which, like Germans at meat, operates in the realm of connotative signification vis-a-vis -vis successive alienations. In order to be sustained, capitalist ideology must alienate its constituent elements from one another. The worker must be unpaid for the full value of his labor in order to obtain profit. The workforce must be divided in order for it to remain mysterious to itself. Input will be the realm of the manager, output will be the realm of the worker, and never the twain shall meet, except that in reality they rely upon one another intimately. What separates them is the notion of financial independence, which the capitalist system ostensibly works to promote, rewarding certain types of production with opportunities to consume greater shares of that production in a competitive process that incentivizes individual recapitulations of the capitalist system. The capitalist system is a feedback loop, and its, its, its ideology is a solipsistic one. Germans must eat in order to consume. The sun has never set upon the British Empire, because the British Empire is a linguistic subroutine called metaphor that is the heart of the ideological basis of capitalism. On the verge of the First World War, Germany is poised, eager to illustrate to the world that it understands the metaphor, understands that in capitalist ideology, metaphor is as real as meat, because ideology is fundamentally a connotative process. Pardon me. As the Titanic sinks, the era of the transoceanic vessel comes to a close, and ideology must grow fins. <laughs> the Germans may have sunk the Lusitania with their Unterseebooten, but Americans have always had a more particular taste for seafood. Thank you very much. We're going to give a round of applause for the capitalist system. Okay, now for systems in general. There's a bigger applause for capitalism than just a general vague system. Let's give a round of applause for that. <laughs>